Locho sambo pagyuta shi pa tu che tempe tinle yar ngoda Pet ge drolor zambe tse parache Palde lame shabla solvade Omo a guru vajra dara sumati monisha sane Uta Varda Nishri Varda Varsa Manya Sarva Siddhi Hu Oma Guru Vajrada Sumati Munisha Sane Karma Uta Varda Nishri Varda Varsa Manya Sarva Siddhi Hu Oma Guru Karma Uta Varda Nishri Bhadra Varsa Manya Sarva Siddhi Ho Pakyukye Kudan Dagilu Pakyukye Sundan Dagilu Pakyukye Tugdan Dagilu Teyer me chiktu jingil Ma kyukye kudan da gilu Ma kyukye sundan da gilu Ma kyukye tukdan da gilu Teyer me chiktu jingil In the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, I take refuge until enlightenment. Through the practice of generosity and the other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. When Buddha reached enlightenment, the first thing that he said, according to one sutra called Lalita Vistara, it was Sabshi Chodawesa Dumache Dutsi Tabu Chushi Kowani Sula Shekin Kowar Minupe Mime Nagit Salto Nebra Cha, which translated into English is something like that. Profound and peaceful, free of elaboration 
as clear light and non-composed. Such a nectar I have found. To whoever I explain will not understand. So I stay by myself in the forest where there is no one. Then 49 days after, Buddha was requested to give teachings and then he went to Varanasi to give the first teachings. But these first words which Buddha said, he refers to what? <coughs> to something that is profound because it's the ultimate nature of everything. It's peaceful because it pacifies all sufferings. It's free of elaboration because this state, because it doesn't have a form like being big or small. It is as clear light because it's the true nature of our deepest, of our subtle mind. And it's non-composed because it doesn't have causes and conditions and parts. Okay. What is this nectar? It is a nectar because it is like the medicine that eliminates all suffering. It cannot be explained. If explained, nobody will understand because it cannot be, under, it cannot be realized conceptually. What is this? It's what, it, what, it's what is normally called as shunyata, emptiness. In Tibetan, tongpanyi, mostly known as emptiness. Okay? So, Let's try to understand a little bit what is this emptiness about. Which is the actual antidote to eliminate the ignorance that grasps at reality as being objective. That is the main cause and the root of all our sufferings, as we have seen before today. Okay. So our mind has a very particular aspect, characteristic, which is we are totally incapable of having two directly objective, when actually it is subjective. But our ignorance is not the mind that says, oh, the glass is not subjective. No. Our ignorance is an affirmation where it affirms what? The inherent existence, the objective existence of something, And actually this affirmation is a false affirmation. But that's how our ignorance manifests. Otherwise, if it was not a false affirmation, it would not be ignorance. So, how can I change that? By developing an opposite state. So, let's draw a small diagram which helps us to understand this. We put, on the first part, we make a box. And we write on it the object, the, basis, the basic object, such as the glass. Okay, so imagine a little glass. Under the glass we put inherent existence, objective existence, autonomous existence, whatever name we like to give to it, okay? But we put inherent existence. Then on one side we put it is off, on the other side we put it is not off. The glass It is of inherent existence. The glass is not of inherent existence. When I say the glass is of inherent existence, this is ignorance. The affirmation. When I say the glass is not of inherent existence, is the negation. That is wisdom. Instead of saying the glass is not of inherent existence, I can say the glass lacks inherent existence. I can say the glass is empty of inherent existence. Okay? So basically, between wisdom and ignorance, the only difference is a small word. Is or is not. Is, is it clear? Because basically, ignorance, what is ignorance doing? It's affirming something that doesn't exist. What is wisdom de- doing? It's negating such affirmation. So, one very important thing to understand also with that is that whenever we talk about emptiness, many of us have already listened 
to the words which say, all phenomena are empty. Everything is of the nature of emptiness. And sometimes people take an understanding from this as to say nothing exists. But let's make things more clear. First of all, when I say that something is empty, first of all, it can only be empty if it exists. The glass cannot be empty if the glass doesn't exist. So when I say that something is empty, first of all, I'm saying that this object exists. All right? Second, if it is empty, it must be empty of something. Just to say it's empty doesn't mean anything. If I ask you, is this glass empty or not? What do you think? You're really don't, afraid of giving the wrong answer. <laughs> And is this singing bowl empty or not? Isn't it full of air? Yes. <laughs> Or is it empty of water? There is no water inside. It's empty of water, but it's not empty of air. And this glass, is it empty? To be able to give the answer, you must ask me, empty of what? Is it empty of milk? Yes. yes. Is it empty of water? No. Okay. So basically, if we ask something, is it empty? In order for us to be able to affirm that, we must ask, empty of what? Okay. So in the moment that we say, all phenomena are empty, of what? If we don't understand what, empty of what, then we cannot understand this negation. And then we end up to the wrong understanding that they don't exist. So, here we come to one verse from a very important master called Shantideva, from more than 1,500 years ago. And Shantideva, in the Bodhisattva Charyavatara, I'm not, I think in the, in the ninth chapter, he says, Takpe ngola marrekpar te ngome zin mayin. Without entering in contact with the designated object, it is not possible to apprehend its known existence. Again, without entering in contact with the designated object, it is not possible to apprehend its known existence. Okay. For example, is there an elephant in this room? I'm not asking the representation of an elephant. I'm asking an elephant, the actual animal. Is there an elephant here? No. Sure not? Yes. Why can we say that there is no elephant here? Because we don't see. Because we don't see, but before of that, because we are able to imagine how would be an elephant here. Because maybe I would not see, but I would smell the elephant here. Okay? So, the point is that the only reason why I can negate the existence of an elephant here is because I can imagine what would be the affirmation. I can apprehend the object of negation. So, without entering in contact with the designated object, what is the designated object here? The elephant in the room. So, without being able to imagine it, to generate the mental image of what would be an elephant in the room, I am not able to negate it. So without entering in contact with the designated object, it's not possible to, to apprehend its known existence. I can only apprehend the known existence of an elephant here when I'm able to imagine how it would be if an elephant was here. Okay? So, whenever there is a negation of something, What is the fundamental point to understand such negation? Understand, first of all, the object of negation. If we don't understand clearly the object of negation, we will never ever understand the negation. Same thing is when I have affirmation, actually. 
And the only way to understand an affirmation is first understanding the object of affirmation. Okay? So, it's just as I said before, if I ask, there is, is there Dharmakaya here? You know? It depends what we understand for Dharmakaya. It's the very subtle mind of a Buddha. I believe yes, but then that's another story. Okay? But the point is that we cannot comprehend an affirmation without understanding the object of affirmation. We can, cannot comprehend a negation without understanding the object of negation. So we go back to our diagram. The glass, inherent existence, it is, it is empty of, or it is not. So what do we need first to understand here, to understand both the affirmation and the negation? What is the object in between? Inherent existence. If I don't understand what I mean by inherent existence, I can never understand what I mean by being empty of inherent existence or being of inherent existence. And the very key point here is that the object of negation that we are talking about is the object of negation of ignorance, but not... Is the, actually, sorry, the object of negation of wisdom is the object of affirmation of ignorance. Okay? And the point here is that it's not just general ignorance that we are talking about. It's our own ignorance. And that's fundamentally important for us to get. Otherwise, we can pass years and years and years negating inherent existence and saying that all phenomena lack inherent existence because everything is interdependent and we can learn all the reasoning and we can go through it again and again and again saying that everything lacks inherent existence because everything is of the nature of emptiness and shunyata because everything is interdependent but I do it just as if I was watching a movie outside of me I need to remember that the object of negation is not inherent existence, generally speaking. It's the inherent existence as I see it, through my own ignorance. When I look at the glass, and I see, and the glass appears to me as being of inherent existence, that's the object of negation. So the only way to develop wisdom in this case is first by seeing one's own ignorance. First, I must see the target. Then I can find the right way how to get on it. But the target is not outside. The target is inside. So, first step is understanding that actually, yes, all phenomena lack inherent existence. But first thing, I must see this inherent existence. I must be able to touch it. I must be able to see and recognize that my... In, in other words, first step is to see my own ignorance as ignorance. Then I can do something about it. But first I must recognize it as ignorance. I don't think... It, it's clear. Okay? So when we talk about emptiness, What do we mean by emptiness? That phenomena are empty of something. What is this something? So-called inherent existence. What is this inherent existence? It's the object of affirmation of the ignorance. Okay? To make an example, to make things more easy. Impermanence and permanence. What is the ignorance? Phenomena, impermanent phenomena, like the glass, and under I put permanent. The glass is permanent, the glass is not permanent. Okay? Where is the ignorance? The glass is permanent. Wisdom? The glass is not permanent. But for that I must first see what I mean by the glass being permanent. Okay? And here comes, normally when we say the glass is impermanent, impermanent is naturally a negation of permanence. Okay? In Tibetan language, actually, it's very precise. 
because the word, I think in English actually also, but in Tibetan we call takpa, which is permanent, and mi takpa, impermanent. Mi, in this case, a negation, not permanent. And uh, I think impermanent is also a negation of being permanent, no? In English also, okay? So, basically, the only way how I can realize the lack of something being permanent is first understanding what it means for it to be permanent. So when I see how I grasp at something, I look at a glass and I understand how it appears to me as being permanent, how I grasp at it, ah, then the object of that grasping, of that affirmation, that's what we need to negate. I don't know if it's clear. Yes? No? <laughs> Half the way? <laughs> huh? Not yet, okay. As we said before, you know, when we talk, we transmit, but what we listen, we listen to sounds, and then we need to attribute meaning, and that's not always <laughs> that simple. So we go once again through it. Let's look for another example. <laughs> okay, we go back to the, what we have talked before. Reality is objective or is subjective? Subjective. subjective? subjective, right? How do we normally see things? How do we see subjective reality? As being? Objective. Okay? And because of that, all the rest of our troubles come from. Okay, then we already saw that before. Now, if we go to look where is the problem coming from, it's not coming from seeing the, sub- the, the subjective reality as not being subjective. We don't even think about that. It's not that we look at a glass and we say, look at a glass, it is not subjective. We just look at it, and we, it appears as being objective, and we grasp at it in that way. Okay? So how do I take away the thought that the glass is objective? By negating it. Okay? So where is the ignorance? Is the affirmation that the glass is of objective reality. What is the wisdom? The glass? is not of, because the, the glass being subjective, it's correct, it's also wisdom, but it's not directly opposite to the glass being objective. Because being subjective, being objective, now is not the precise word, but being interdependent and not being of inherent existence is not directly opposite. Okay? Being interdependent, which is how things exist, okay, and not being of inherent existence, are both correct, but they are not directly, uh, how to say, contradictory. Again, being interdependent and being of inherent existence, okay, They are contradictory, but they are not directly opposite to each other. Okay? Can you see where clouds have no inherent existence? Haven't problems with the glass? You know, empty empty of mouth or empty of your No, but glass being empty of inherent existence, what it means? Which means that the glass exists only in dependence with the observer as a glass. Okay? So, it means that it doesn't exist by itself alone. It exists in dependence of the observer. That's what we said before today. External existence exists in dependence of internal existence. It's like the here and there. Vice versa. Okay? So, the wisdom that we must develop to eliminate our ignorance is the wisdom that realizes 
that whatever object lacks such inherent existence. This inherent existence is the same that our ignorance is affirming. Okay, so that's why we put in the diagram the glass, inherent existence, it is ignorance, it is not wisdom. So that's where the main difference is coming from. Basically, if I understand, if I, see, if I see that a glass is interdependent, that it depends on cause and conditions, it depends on the observer and so on, all this will bring me to the conclusion that the glass is not of inherent existence. But it's not a direct opposite mode of apprehension. Okay? It's like if I put the glass is of inherent existence, and on the other side I put the glass is interdependent, they are not directly opposite, even though they are contradictory. Because anything that is interdependent cannot be of inherent existence. Make another example. The glass is permanent. Then on the other side I put the glass interacts is composed, the glass is, uh, has, has causes and conditions. It's not directly opposite, even though it's contradictory, because anything that has cause and conditions and anything that interacts cannot be permanent. But still, it's not directly opposite. To be directly opposite, it must have the same object. The glass, and then we have permanent. One side it is, the other side it's not. We okay? And then it has the object which is inherent existence. The wisdom to oppose it, the mind to oppose it, must always go back to the same final destination. Okay, so what is the point from, of departure? The glass. Destination, inherent existence. This must be the same on both wisdom and ignorance. On one side it says it is, the other side it says it's not. Okay? So, because of that, that we put so much emphasis into emptiness, into saying that everything is of the nature of emptiness, and so and so on. But this doesn't mean at all that nothing exists. This means that everything lacks inherent existence. Nothing exists being objective. Maybe, maybe you have already listened to something saying, oh, everything is an illusion. Existence is an illusion. We live in an illusion. No. Existence is not an illusion. It has an illusory aspect, which is, it appears, as, it appears in a way that it is not. In that way, ask, yes. But to say that existence is an illusion means that existence does not exist. That's false. The fact is that existence, ex- reality exists, but it doesn't exist as it appears. Because it appears as being objective when it is not. It appears of being of inherent existence when it is not. It's like when we say reality is like a dream. Because it appears in a way that it is not. It appears as being of inherent existence when actually it is not. But existence do exist, otherwise it will not be called so. There are many, many examples that are given. We can say dreamlike, like an illusion, like the reflection of the face in the mirror. We have many, many examples that are given. Which basically are examples, are metaphors, for things that are not as they appear. So reality exists, but it doesn't exist as it appears. Why? Because it appears as being of inherent existence, as being objective, when actually it is not. Okay. Well then. If we get clear at this point, we already did a big job today. We already got something really important done, because Very often it takes a long time until we can understand something about what emptiness means, you know. 
Normally you can pass years and years listening, oh, what emptiness, what is that? And we try to understand, it looks something far away and mystical and magical. It's just a negation. <laughs> that is opposite to our own ignorance. But at the same time, it's the ultimate nature of everything. <coughs> at the same time, it is profound because of the deepest nature of everything, because everything lacks inherent existence. It's peaceful because through the lack of inherent existence, all the ignorance and defilement specify. Okay? So it's something, it's like a nectar, because this is what allows us to eliminate suffering as a whole. That simple negation. Okay. We go to the fourth seal. The fourth seal, it says, Nyangele debe shiwao. So we have just seen the third one, which was Chotam Chetong Shin Dakmeba. All phenomena are empty and lack an autonomous, independent, inherent existence. And now we go to the next one. Beyond suffering, there is peace. Or peace is beyond suffering. Okay? Beyond suffering is another way of translating nirvana. Nirvana, the state beyond sorrow, the state beyond suffering. That's one of the meanings of the word nirvana. So, the main point here is the fact that, and it's a very, very important part in Buddhism, is that we can all reach the state of Buddhahood. It's possible for each and every one of us to reach the state of Buddhahood. It's possible to go beyond sorrow. It's possible to reach a, de- a true, truly deep state of, of peace. It's possible for everyone, without any exception, even an end. It's a matter of having the right conditions and putting the effort in the right directions. But we all have the same identical conditions, no sorry, the same identical potential to do it. But here comes to one important point, which is that we have a Buddha nature. And uh, maybe very often you have listened saying, oh, we all have the same Buddha nature, we have a pure nature. Some people even say, oh, we are Buddhas, but we don't know. But before entering into that, What is a Buddha? Otherwise we constantly talk about Buddhas and we don't even don't know what we are talking about, you know? And you say, oh, we all can become Buddha. Does this mean that I need to become fat like the Chinese Buddha, you know? <laughs> Or does this mean that I need to look how I am a woman? Do I need... Okay, what do we mean by Buddha, first of all? That's the first thing. In Tibetan, Buddha, Sangye, means The literal translation of Sangye, which is the word which is used for Sang, means to eliminate. Eliminate, develop. Because that's the literal meaning of Sangye. Sang means to eliminate, Ge means to develop. Eliminate what? A Buddha is the one that has eliminated the two obscurations, which are called in Tibetan, the obscuration of defilements, Nyuntip, and the obscuration to omniscience, or the obscuration to knowledge, Shetip in Tibetan. So, what are these two obscurations? Let's try to understand them. The obscuration of defilements is basically ignorance and all the other defilements that come with it. Anger, jealousy, pride, miserliness, and so and so on. Okay? These are all part of the obscuration of defilement, which basically is ignorance and everything that comes after it. Then we have the obscuration of, omni- of two omniscience, shetrip, or the obscuration to knowledge, there are different ways of translating it, which basically is the obscuration, sorry, which basically is the imprints of ignorance. Okay? What are the imprints of ignorance? Again, 
Ignorance is the grasping at inherent existence. And the imprints of ignorance is the appearance of inherent existence. As we saw before, how does our ignorance work? I see the glass. The glass appears to me as if it was objective, autonomously existing, inherently existent. And what I do? I believe in it. I grasp at it as being of inherent existence. So ignorance is the grasping at inherent existence. And the imprints of ignorance is the appearance of inherent existence that comes before. Okay? So, if we make the connection directly, the grasping at inherent existence is the obstruction of defilements, and the appearance of inherent existence is the obstruction to omniscience. Okay? In other words, if we eliminate the obstruction of defilements, if we eliminate the grasping at inherent existence, if we eliminate ignorance, we go out of the cycle of suffering. But we are not yet a Buddha. We can only become a Buddha when we eliminate the imprints of ignorance, which are the appearance of inherent existence. Okay. And at the same time, we need to develop our qualities, which in essence is wisdom and love. When we develop wisdom and love at its maximum potential, and all the other qualities such as generosity, morality, patience, and so on, but they all, in essence, we can con- condense it in within love, compassion as one, and wisdom as the other. Once we develop both completely, at the maximum potential, we become a Buddha. So we all have the same potential to become a Buddha. Why? Because we have a pure nature. What do we mean by having a pure nature? First of all, let's try to understand better the word pure. For example, there is this mantra which says Om Swabhava Shuddha Sarva Dharma Swabhava Shuddha Ham All phenomena are of a clean nature pure nature, I am of a pure nature. I am of a clean nature. So normally, when we say that something is clean, that something is pure, what does it mean? That it's free of some sort of impurity. Okay? It's free from some sort of dirt. That's why it's clean. It depends what we see as dirt to define if it's clean or not. It can be clean for one and it cannot be clean for another. It depends what we recognize as dirt. No? It's like when I was in India and sometimes I, I, I landed the fridge to the house. I had one of the very few fridges in the monastery. And sometimes they ask to put meat or other things inside. And I said, okay. I said, as long as you clean it after. And then when it was finished, they would take the same piece of cloth that they used for the floor and they would go around like this inside, you know. <laughs> And it was stinky and dirty. And then I would go, but did you clean? Ah, yes, I cleaned. It's clean. Okay, for them it's clean. For me it's not. Why? Because we have a different idea of what is dirt. Okay. So basically, when we say that something is clean, it means that it's free from dirt. So when we say that something is pure, It's free from impurity. Okay? So when we say that I am pure, it means that I am free from impurity. What is the impurity that I am free from? Inherent existence. I am of a pure nature. What is my pure nature? The fact that I am free of inherent existence. What is the nature of a Buddha? He's free of inherent existence. Buddha is not of inherent existence. And so am I. The glass is also free of inherent existence. Okay? So basically, there is a, this is a very, very important point that very often is wrongly understood. When we say that we all have a pure nature, and the wrong understanding, the wrong understanding that often people get is that 
be having a pure nature means that actually I am pure, truly. But what happened? For whatever reason, I manifest myself as being ignorant and suffering and this and that. But truly, I am pure. Or, one day I was pure, then suddenly something happened and I became impure. If my nature is to be pure. You know? And then we think, oh, we have all a pure nature. Then there comes the question, but what happened for me to become impure? Whose mistake it was? Was it my mistake? Then how could I really be truly pure if I did a mistake? And if it was someone else's mistake, someone else's fault that I became impure, then it's even worse. Because this means I depend on someone else to become pure again. So the question is, can we point a moment in which we were not ignorant? In which we were free from defilements and the imprints of these defilements? No. Since begin last time, we have been ignorant. Now, are we still pure? Yes. Why? Are we still of pure nature? And we are still pure, both. Why? Because we are free of inherent existence. Can one day we eliminate ignorance? Yes. Can we get free from suffering? Yes. Why? Because we have a pure nature. What is this pure nature? The fact that we are interdependent. The fact that we lack inherent existence. We exist on the basis of a complex interdependence that we are constantly interacting. And the main difference between <coughs> us and a Buddha is because that we live in a positive, negative, negative, positive interdependence. And the Buddha is constantly in a positive interdependence. That's the main difference. If we generate If we interact in a positive way, gradually we create positive results. The more we create the positive interdependence, the more we create positive results, until we can be fully on this positive interdependence. But a Buddha and ourselves both live in the same reality. If we use another terminology, we could say we all follow the same laws of physics somehow, you know? In the sense that I am interdependent, a Buddha is interdependent, I lack inherent existence, the Buddha lack inherent existence, the only, but the Buddha understands it and I don't. But I can get there. Why can I become a Buddha? Because I am interdependent, because I lack inherent existence. That's why I can become a Buddha. Because if gradually I start making changes in the way I talk, in the way I act, in the way I think, And I make these changes in the right direction. One interacts with the other, and gradually I will come to that state. But that's why I can become a Buddha. Because my nature is pure, in the sense that I am free of inherent existence. I have the true nature of myself and my mind is being of the nature of emptiness. Emptiness of what? Of inherent existence. So, for me, this is extremely beautiful. It's extremely powerful. Because when we get the idea, oh, we are of a pure nature in the sense that we are all pure and for whatever reason we became impure, that's not working in my mind. Because we lose completely our own freedom. Because how can I become pure if it doesn't depend on me? What happens? It doesn't work. But in the moment that I am interdependent, which means every action I do interacts with the rest and gradually one can bring to the other, this means I can change myself. Can I develop wisdom and eliminate ignorance gradually? Yes. That's why I can become a Buddha myself. Okay. So, from this there are a few things that I like to explain which may not be so easy to understand, but for some it may be very useful, for some it may not be so useful, but still I like to explain them. First thing is that to truly understand, I'm not talking about realize, but to understand conceptually at least what is a Buddha, we must first understand emptiness. Why? A Buddha is the one that has eliminated the two obscurations. Which, in other words, the Buddha is the one 
that have no more grasping at inherent existence, and at the same time, phenomena do not even appear to him as being of inherent existence. So he has overcome both appearance and grasping of inherent existence. That's a Buddha. So in order for me to understand what that means, I need to understand what is inherent existence, what it means the lack of inherent existence, and so on. Okay? Can I do the same? Yes. Why? Because my mind and myself lack inherent existence. Because it is interdependent. Me too. So from understanding the emptiness of myself and the emptiness of my mind, which means I don't as exist as I am in an autonomous, independent way, because if I would exist inherently, autonomously, objectively as I am, I could never be different. But because I do not exist inherently, autonomously, objectively as I am, but subjectively, interdependently as I am, I can change. And because of that, I can become a Buddha. It takes it some time, but it's possible. Okay. A long time ago, when the teachings of Buddha were given, like more or less 1,500 years ago in India and so on, the disciples were divided into two groups. The more intelligent and the less intelligent. And since long time, since many centuries in Tibet already, we have all been put in the category of the less intelligent ones. Okay? This doesn't mean that we are stupid. I'm right? just making the difference between the two. What's the main difference? The more intelligent ones, Wambo Numbo, is the ones that actually, before believing in anything, they must first deeply understand it. So they will never take refuge in Buddha before first understanding what is a Buddha and understanding one's own potential of enlightenment. Then they will take refuge. The less, and for that, the teachings that are given for the more intelligent disciples, first they teach emptiness, then after they go to explain refuge and to explain compassion and all the rest. Because how can I wish to be a Buddha if I don't know what is a Buddha? The less intelligent disciples' approach is that of mixing the two things together. Okay, so first I say, oh yes, the Buddha is supreme, is incredible, is wonderful and so on, we must all reach that state and create the deep connection with a Guru, he's explaining things to us, we believe, we feel touched and finally there we are taking refuge in the Buddha that we really don't understand so much what it is, but we like it. Okay. And then, hopefully, in time, we come to understand truly what a Buddha is, and then we come deeply to take refuge once again. Our refuge goes deeper later. Because for many of us, if we start by saying, first step, okay, before even explaining what is a Buddha, first let's explain emptiness. You know, half, two, third, okay. 80% now of the people will go away. We are not ready for it, most of us. So instead, we start first with love and compassion and all the other part, which is very important. Because on the path to enlightenment, wisdom is the direction. It's the two. It's the wisdom is like the vehicle. Emptiness. Wisdom is the vehicle. Love and compassion is the gasoline that we put in to make it go. It's like the two wings necessary to go to enlightenment. But the fourth seal, beyond, beyond suffering, beyond sorrow, there is peace, is the fact that we can all reach enlightenment because our nature is pure. And our pure nature ultimately is the lack of inherent, inherent existence of ourselves. That's what we mean by having a pure nature. Okay? So if we ask, is our nature pure? Yes. Are we pure? Yes. What do we mean by that? that we are not ignorant, <coughs> suffering beings by its own self in an inherent way. Because if it was, then we would always be the same. But because, yes, we are ignorant, we are suffering, we have anger, we have jealousy, but in an interdependent way. 
And because of that, we can change it. So, how is the process to make that change? How is the process to become a Buddha? I will explain it briefly, okay, without entering into many details, but making it very brief, which is like the road map to enlightenment. It's divided into what are called the five paths and the ten bumis, the ten stages. The five paths are the path of accumulation, Soklam, the path of the path of preparation, Jorlam, the path of seeing, Gomlam, the path of meditation, Gomlam, and the path of no more seeing, of no more learning, Miloblam. Okay? How does the whole process happen? Just we just make an outline now, like a very gross, not without going into details of this roadmap to enlightenment. Because we may say, if it's possible to reach enlightenment, can you explain me how? So here we come with a roadmap for enlightenment. First step, fall in love with enlightenment. Which means, develop this deep, strong wish, I must become a Buddha myself. The Mahayana path, because I want to help all sentient beings. In the Hinayana path, because I don't want to suffer anymore. But basically is, I deeply want to become a Buddha, strongly. That's my main priority, full-time job. That's what we call to develop renunciation, or to develop bodhicitta, depending on the case of the path that we follow. Okay? So, first step, fall in love with enlightenment. Develop the deep, strong wish to reach the state of Buddhahood. Then we enter into the path of accumulation. Second step, We need to develop the three wisdoms regarding emptiness. The three wisdoms regarding emptiness are called the wisdom of listening, the wisdom of comprehending, and the wisdom of meditating in relation to emptiness. There is that in relation to many other things, but in this case, in relation to emptiness. So first of all, how, what does it mean to develop the wisdom of listening about emptiness? is when we have heard enough about what is inherent existence, our ignorance is the mind that grasps at inherent existence, but actually it is not like that because everything is interdependent, because external reality depends on the internal reality, nothing exists objectively because it depends on the imputation of the name, the value that we attribute, and so on. Okay? Once I understand that, and I get myself to the conclusion, nothing exists, inherently, as it appears. I don't know exactly why yet, but I develop what is called a valid assumption. The valid assumption is I don't have any direct experience that phenomena lack like inherent existence. I do not truly deeply understand why, but I know that it's like that, based on listening. When do we develop that? When we are able to recognize the object of negation of emptiness. When they were that we are able to see, oh look, the glass appears to me as being of inherent existence and I believe in it. But actually I think it's not like that. That's when we have developed the wisdom of listening. Okay, so when we recognize, when we are able to imagine what is inherent existence and to say actually it doesn't exist but that's how it appears to me. That's when we actually develop the wisdom of listening. Second step, wisdom of comprehending, is when we develop what is called a valid inferential cognition. A valid inferential cognition is a perception based on logic, is a conceptual understanding based on logic, and based on a correct logic. So in which I say, okay, the glass or any other phenomena lacks inherent existence, is empty of inherent existence. Why? Because it's interdependent and it makes sense to me. And I understand it deeply. In other words, it is when the fact that phenomena lack inherent existence is not anymore something that someone has said and I believe. It's something that I have my own deep understanding and my own certainty about it. When I reach that, I reach the wisdom of comprehension. 
The next step, the wisdom of meditation. Once I have reached that, and then I go and I start meditating single-pointedly by first entering into an analytical meditation about emptiness. So first I observe the glass, I see how the glass appears to my mind as being of inherent existence, then I see the mind that goes to grasp at it as being of inherent existence, then I negate it through analysis. Okay? I go and say, no, the glass is not of inherent existence. Why? Because it's interdependent. It depends on cause and conditions. It depends on its own parts. It depends on the value that I attribute to it, the name that I give to it. The glass is nothing more, nothing less than a name based on a unity of parts. Okay? When I get to the conclusion it lacks inherent existence, then we stay single-pointed, concentrated on the single fact of being empty of inherent existence, on the negation itself. Okay? There is no more even the perception of the glass, there is just, it lacks inherent existence. And we stay in the lack of inherent existence single-pointedly. When we are able to do that, and without mental agitation, and without mental dullness, and the fact of being in the single-pointed state of meditation on the lack of inherent existence, bring us a state of peace and well-being to the body and the mind, we have reached what is called shamatha, or calm abiding. Okay, shine in Tibetan. When we reach that state, we have developed the so-called wisdom of meditation regarding emptiness. The next step is we should develop what is called vipassana, or profound view, which is While being in single-pointed concentration on the lack of inherent existence, one small part of the mind comes out and starts analyzing how come it is empty of inherent existence. In the beginning it's difficult. When, out of this analysis, without losing the single-pointed concentration, without a mental agitation or mental dullness, when through this analysis together it brings a state of well-being to the body and the mind, and one is able to stay into this state without any rough effort, the practitioner has reached the state called the vipassana, or the profound view of emptiness, and have entered what is called the path of preparation. One, we know that the practitioner has entered the path of preparation when he developed the profound view or vipassana on emptiness, what we have just explained. After that, is still a conceptual understanding of emptiness. He is still meditating on his own own mental image of emptiness. Then, by staying in that meditation for a long and long time, again and again, again and again, there is a moment in which the perception of emptiness becomes not any more conceptual, but it becomes a direct valid cognition. Which means, It is non-conceptual experience of the lack of inherent existence. Once the practitioner is able to have this direct, non-conceptual experience of the lack of inherent existence, this perception, he has entered into what is called the path of seeing. And by that he has eliminated his own ignorance and has got out of the cycle of samsara. Still have a long path to go to reach enlightenment. But at least there is no more suffering. Because there is no more ignorance, because there is no more more grasping at inherent existence, because there has been a direct, um, non-conceptual experience of the lack of inherent existence. So when the practitioner comes out of this meditative state, he is in what we call, he uh, is in the uh, subsequent state of the path of sin. And uh, when he enters into that moment, everything that he sees and perceives still appears as being of inherent existence. But he knows that it is not. Not conceptually, experimentally. experimentally. He knows it by his own experience. Then, when he enters next time into meditation, he is in what is called the path of meditation. And by that, staying in meditation on that for many, 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 many times, Gradually, he's able to eliminate the imprints of ignorance. Until a moment, 
in which he has such an experience that there is not even anymore the appearance of inherent existence. And that's when he reached the so-called path of normal learning or the state of Buddhahood. Okay? Now I have oversimplified it, but normally we study this for years. Huh? There is a very detailed root ma- uh, road map of every part of it we call Salam in Tibetan. Normally we studied it more or less for one year. That's what I have studied. <coughs> and then we have the very detailed part of each one of these, what's the meaning, how it is, how it is not, and so on. But as we go in the fourth seal, which says, which means it's possible to reach enlightenment for each one of us, there is a pathway for that. There is a road map for that. And where do we start? By wishing to reach enlightenment and by understanding what is inherent existence. By understanding emptiness. And that's what we are doing. So the fact that we are passing these two days together, understanding what is emptiness, understanding where is our defilements and our suffering coming from, and so on, this means we are on the path. Okay? Not from a, how to say, just conceptual point of view, from a very practical point of view. We are on the path. Because in the moment that I start to familiarize myself with the lack of inherent existence, to understand where is my ignorance coming from, what is ignorance, what is wisdom, Where is my suffering coming from? How are the defilements working? And so on and so on. I am already into the path. Okay? So, with this we conclude the fourth seal. That we all can become a Buddha. Why? Because our mind is pure. Because we are pure in the sense that we lack inherent existence. And if we generate a correct attitude of mind, of speech, of body, Gradually, we enter into positive interdependence and we can gradually understand emptiness, meditate on it, experience it. And by that we overcome our own ignorance and by that we overcome our selfishness and all the other defilements that come with it. Because what happens is the following. I can practice patience as an antidote for anger. Okay? And I can learn and I can reflect that anger is bad for me and I can go on and on and, and I can practice patience and I can really be able not to get angry but to hold my anger and to pacify my anger. But the moment I stop putting the effort to pacify the anger and I am in front of an object of anger again, what's the tendency? Anger will manifest. The only way to eliminate truly, deeply anger is by realizing that the object of anger doesn't exist as an object of anger by its own characteristics. It's empty of inherent existence. So, emptiness is the key to eliminate anger, jealousy, pride, miserliness, and all the other defilements. In the meantime, we need to deal with them. Huh? But the true key for enlightenment is emptiness. It's also the one that helps us to develop a deeper state of love and compassion. Because one thing is that I, I, I love you and I want you to be happy and by happiness I mean pleasures. The other thing is I understand that the true state of well-being comes from realizing the true nature of reality. And I want that for you. I love you in a deeper level. <coughs> One thing is I want you to be free from suffering, but I mean by suffering pain and unhappiness. Another thing is I wish you to be free from suffering, and for suffering I recognize being in the state of ignorance and being in the state of the imprints of ignorance, which is called in Tibetan mimik peninche, the compassion without object. When I have compassion, In the sense that I wish you to be free from ignorance and the imprints of ignorance. That's the deeper state of compassion. As a conclusion, how do I know if I am going or not in the right direction regarding emptiness and regarding the path to enlightenment? If 
the more I meditate on emptiness, the more I reflect on the true nature of reality, the more I disconnect from reality and from myself, and I don't care anymore about things because I don't feel anymore that there is a law of cause and effect because everything is empty, and I disconnect from others, it means that I'm going in the wrong direction. <laughs> okay? The more I meditate on emptiness, and the more I see the power of interdependence, and the more I understand the law of karma, the more I understand the power of every action and every choice, and the more I open my heart with love and compassion, it means I am going in the right direction. Okay. Because the first one which I told means we go into a nihilistic view, and that's very dangerous. It has happened many times in the history of Buddhism. We need to be careful from it. We need to protect ourselves from such use. And um, so this is the four seals. Everything, all composed phenomena are impermanent. Dijetam Jimitapa. Everything that is impure is of the nature of suffering. All phenomena are empty and lack an autonomous existence. Beyond suffering, there is peace. To have these four views in our life, it means to have the world view of a Buddha. So, what do we do, supposedly, as a Buddhist? We put an effort to develop these four views. To see the impermanent phenomena as impermanent. To recognize that our mind and our inner state of emotions is not the result of the world around us, but is the other way around. The way how we see the world is the result of how we are. To see that we live in an interdependent reality where reality appears to us as if it was objective, autonomous, inherently existent, but actually it is not, because everything is interdependent, and I cannot perceive the world independently of my own self. External reality and internal reality are co-dependent, in the sense that one depends on the other. They are interdependent. And beyond sorrow there is peace. Nyangele de I have the potential to become a Buddha myself. Why? Because I myself lack inherent existence. I am of the nature of emptiness. I am interdependent. And because of that, I can become a Buddha myself. By following the correct path. Okay. So, these four points that we have seen are very important as the basis of Buddhist philosophy. So I request you to listen to it again and again, to reflect upon it again and again, and to gradually do the best on your abilities to put it into practice. That's all I ask. Okay? So we can have some understanding of what are the fundamentals of Buddhist philosophy, and we can gradually apply it to our life to make a change of our own world view. All right. So this is all for today. I would like to say thank you to everyone for your patience, for your kindness of being present here, as we say, with an open mind, with an attent- uh, how to say, attentive mind and an open heart. Okay? And then uh, that's all. So we go for the final dedications. Omo sobhava vishyate dharma te benza siddhi ho namo sarva tata gata bhaya vishyo muke vye sarva te kam eo gate parana he man kankana kam soha omo amrite humpe om akaro muka sarva dharma madhye nube natyute Namo sarva tata gata avalukite om sambara sam ruru puru sarva tishta siddha lotsa sarva arta sadana yesoha dagi sambetodani teshin shebe chindoda 
Chage yinge tanam ki tanda kanda samba. Teda tamche chile. Topa me para jungur chi. By the power of my thoughts, by the power of the blessings of all the Tathagatas, and by the power of the sphere of reality, may any purpose we desire be realized without obstructions. Jetsun lame kutse rapten chi nam karatrile chochur gepada losan tempe drome sasumi drove munsel tatu ne Nimo dele tsendele, nime kuyan dele shi. Nise tatu dele pe, koncho sumki jingiro. Koncho sumki madruso, koncho sumki trashi shu. At dawn or dusk, at night or midday, May the three jewels grant us their blessings. May they help us to achieve all realizations and sprinkle the path of our lives with various signs of auspiciousness. Repeat after me. Sem Cho Sutro Cho Lam Tutro Lam La Parche Myong Arsho May the mind Become the Dharma. May the Dharma become the path. May the path be free from interferences.